Welcome to Theologically Speaking, a podcast of BJU Seminary. I'm your host, Eric Newton. How do we think about the ideas arising within us and swirling around us? And how do we minister in a world like ours? If the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, we have to know God and think His thoughts after Him. Therefore, the mission of Theologically Speaking is to have conversations that help listeners cultivate theological habits of mind and heart and ministry. It's a privilege to be talking today with Jim Wigginton. Jim has worked as a corporate leader for uh, several different businesses, including as an an executive leader at Michelin, Uh, but a little over eight years ago started a business coaching company called Broad Insights, which he leads as president and managing partner. Uh, More significantly, I think if you talk to him, he'd say uh, he's been married to uh, his wife, Cindy, and uh, his father for over 30 years, his father of five adult children, uh, four boys and, a, and a, a young lady. He also serves as an elder at uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on Theologically Speaking. Well, we appreciate the opportunity and an honor to, to be with you. I, I think a good place to begin might be with uh, you're just sharing a little bit of background of why and how you started a, uh, a business coaching company. Frankly, um, probably many of our listeners are, are like me in the respect that I don't think I even knew such a thing existed um, before I heard you start talking about it. So can you tell us a little bit about the, about the beginnings? Yeah, we, we started back in uh, September of 2012 when I lost my corporate job because I had been witnessing at work and the Lord has really blessed our business in October and that fall of 2012, I went and got some professional uh, training in coaching and, you know, uh, leaders are lonely. Uh, They are supposed to be the answer people. They're supposed to be the people that others come to for advice and counsel. And frankly, they often need that. But most, um, most business owners and leaders, pastors, uh, they don't have a, a person that they can talk to who's safe. Their family may be a little fatigued with hearing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, especially as a senior pastor, it sometimes can be difficult to find someone that you can truly confide in. That's not a good situation, but, but leaders are supposed to be, uh, you know, have their act together. And uh, there's a public persona that, certainly appropriate and not hypocritical, but we really do coaching for all sorts of organizational leaders. And we just come alongside and we're a sounding board. We're a place to, to come and talk and bounce ideas off of. And uh, we just provide that sort of counsel. And the reason we call it broad insights is across a spectrum of organizational challenges, whether that be interpersonal conflicts, whether it be strategic planning, whether it be financial, their own personal development, we try to provide some insights uh, into ways in which they can get better. So that's really what we do. We love it. I think we've, as as an organization, we've worked with around 200 different organizations. uh, And uh, I think we've conducted around or been participants in 15,000 different coaching sessions. So it's, it's just been rewarding, one of the greatest things I've done in my life. And we're just there to take burdens off people. I think a lot of times consultants and advisors talk too much. Um, you know, they always want to have the answer. And our, our approach is more to listen first and diagnose before we prescribe. So we, we love the opportunity just to come alongside and unload burdens for leaders and see if we can help them in some way that is non-threatening and, and yet provides real value. Yeah. That's good. Well, one of the things that has stood out to me when I've uh, listened to you uh, talk about leadership is um, how you intentionally apply scriptural truth 
And that's really why I wanted to have a conversation with you on this podcast about how that truth should shape how we think about and how we practice leadership um, as as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe a place to start would be to, to define uh, leadership so that we have some context for what we're discussing. Um, when when somebody says to you, you know, I, I've got a certain position, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not really sure that I'm, I'm leading. I'm not really sure, you know, I, I know what it means to lead, or I need to get better as a leader. What, what are we talking about? What is leadership? Well, I would say it is making those around you more successful. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, providing clarity um, and then, you know, helping folks determine what those action steps are to get better. And then the third major thing is accountability. So there is some accountability, but it's about clarity, actions, and then accountability. So I think serving, you know, as our Lord did, um, making others around us successful is really what I think the essence of leadership is all about. Hmm. The, the, the past 12 months, of course, have been a time of upheaval and uncertainty. I'm sure there are many listeners who uh, have opportunity to lead, whether it's in churches, uh, certainly at home or in the workplace, and, and they've been asking many questions, facing many significant challenges. Um, if, we, if we have a desire to, to please Christ, to see Him glorified in these challenging times, and we take you know, what you've already mentioned in terms of um, helping the people around us uh, be successful, um, what would your advice be for us? How, how can we grow as leaders in 2021? Are, are, are there uh, a few pieces of scriptural advice that you'd say, you know, here's some things to think about um, if we, if we want to grow and if we want to lead uh, in a time that's crying out for, for good leadership? So I, I would say that Proverbs 20, verse 5 is my favorite verse on leadership and on, on coaching. The plans in the heart of man are like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. And we really draw out people's plans, what their needs are, by asking questions. That's the way you draw things down. So for the listeners, I would suggest that we become great at asking questions at our homes, um, you know, sitting down with our wives, sitting down with our children and not interrogating them, but just asking questions and listening. That is a powerful way to know what's going on in their heart. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to be leaders and we're going to truly help other people be more successful, we need to know what's going on with them. They need to feel safe talking with us. And we don't need to always feel like we've got to jump to provide an answer. Let's diagnose, let's, let's determine how we can help and what they're thinking and what their current situation is. So I often, when I meet with, with leaders, business leaders, I'll say, you know, what's on your mind today? Mm -hmm. And we want to rush to fill in this awkward void of, 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 of talking. We want to fill the void of that silence, uh, you know, is, is uncomfortable sometimes for us. But I think just sitting down in an unrushed, without a phone in your hand, without glancing away, fully engaged in listening and asking, you know, how can I help you? What are you facing with regard to challenges today? How can I be better um, in, in serving you? And just waiting on an answer, that's a powerful way to find out what is in the heart of the people that you're working with. Hmm. You know, Eric, one of the things that I did back in corporate America was I, I took a responsibility for a, comp for a uh, part of the company had 200 people. And I decided that I would do a survey of every person individually. I think I spent 30 minutes or so with each of the 200 people. And so that took a su substantial amount of time. And I had, eight questions that I asked every single person. Then I compiled those. And, and there were questions like on a scale of one to 10, how, um, how successfully are we meeting our mission? Um, 
you know, whatever that number was, I would say, what would, what would we need to do in order to take the next step and move it up one level? And, you know, I would ask a question like, what advice do you have for me? Hmm. Those kinds of things. So it wouldn't have to be that formal. It wouldn't have to be that systematic. But I think leadership needs to be about getting beyond the superficial and not just conquering the next task, but really find out what's going on. What are the plans in the heart of that person? And a wise person draws it out. A man of understanding draws it out. And we draw that out by asking these kinds of questions. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And uh, I, I've heard you say that many times, and it really has had a profound impact. I, I don't know that I apply it very well, very consistently, um, but it, it's it's really helpful advice. One, one of the other things um, that uh, you have mentioned in uh, recent discussions uh, has to do with this idea that, that sometimes I think the way you put it is the best thing to say is is nothing at all. Uh, we're living in a period of time where we've got a lot of opportunity to say things, whether it's through social media or other venues. We've got a lot of things uh, to say something about if we want to. Could you talk us through that a little bit, this this idea that sometimes the best thing to say is is actually nothing at all? Well, you know, you got that passage in Proverbs, and I don't, I don't actually have the scriptures in front of me, but I think it's Proverbs twenty six twenty. I could be wrong about that, but it's the, the idea that where there is no wood, the fire goes out. You know, the idea that that you know we just add fuel to the fire by by talking. And I just remember a situation where someone had reacted. Uh, in social media, and there was a group, there were a group of us in an organization. We were talking about should we, in fact, say anything? And I just quoted that verse. And uh, I just think that that we you know, we want to have the last word, um, and uh, you know we want to we want to defend ourselves or even our cause. Maybe it's not personal, and certainly there would be an appropriate time to do that. But you know, even a fool, Proverbs says who shutteth his lips is considered wise. You know, whoso keepeth his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble is another verse. So I just think that uh, it's never good to react. Uh, it's never good to be rash and impulsive and, and emotional in our reactions. So I would just say that uh, there really is a measured approach uh, to uh, all of the, you know, Opinion giving that, that is out there and it is so, uh, you know, prevalent and frankly ubiquitous. Everyone's got their opinion out there. I just think there's a, a wonderful uh, measured approach as a leader where you don't have to opine on everything that comes up. Uh, and I just think it's, uh, it's, it's really the greater part of wisdom. I mean, you look at the number of passages in Scripture that just talk about um, our tongue and the, you know, has the power of life and death. And mm -hmm. it's a little member, James says, boasts great things. Uh, you know, whoever doesn't offend in word is the same as a perfect man. Um, you know, I just, we don't have to have an opinion about everything. We certainly don't have to state it. And whenever we're reacting, it's probably going to be uh, unlikely that we're spirit-filled when we do that. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. There are things to speak up about. We're not talking about being passive. We're not talking about being muzzled. Mm -hmm. But I think in leadership, um, you know, we're on stage, and there's just a way to, to respond to things which isn't reactionary. I tell leaders a lot, look, we need to be reactive, but not reactionary. Hmm. Uh, and I think there's an important distinctive there. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, as, as we're thinking about what um, leaders say, uh, one of the things that I, I've heard you talk about is this idea of, of talking to people and, and not, a, not about people as we sort of 
uh, link from the idea that there are a lot of opinions and we don't necessarily have to give ours or even have to have an opinion. Uh, when we when we take that into interpersonal relationships, whether it's in a church or or a business, um, why do you why do you so emphasize that that point? You know, uh, I think I mentioned we were, we've done probably fifteen thousand hours of coaching as a as a team. I would say if someone were to ask me, what is the number one lesson you have learned um, in your coaching of leaders? And many of them are believers, by the way, not all. And I'm thankful that they're not all believers in the sense that I want this to be part of we want to be evangelizing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I would say the number one thing I have seen in organizations that is destructive is the whole matter of gossip and people love to talk about other people. They don't like to talk to people. And, you know, I think we've all, you know, there have been very few times when I've not said something and I should, at least my personality is that way. And, but yet there's been a lot of times where I've said things that I've regretted. Mm -hmm. And so we do, we, we shy away from, uh, you know, we shy away from reacting and talking and getting angry and, and, and that, that's certainly appropriate, as we've just discussed. But um, if in, a calm, in a calm moment, in the right way and in the right place, confronting people is one of the key things in leadership. To be an effective leader is to do that with kindness and candor. It doesn't have to be um, aggressive. I... I typically begin with questions and uh, I just try to think you know I'm speaking the truth in love the New Testament talks about I want to speak the truth you get that passage in Proverbs 3 3 that talks about let not you know mercy and truth forsake me bind them around my heart or you know to, to that I'm paraphrasing but mm -hmm. the idea there is that apparently it's very difficult to keep those two things in mind, you know, the truth and love at the same time. Right. But, you know, uh, and you've got another passage in Proverbs that talks about the, the person who is re rebukes you will, will afterwards have more honor than the person who simply flatters you. You can meet all kinds of people who are ready to tell you what you want to hear, but to find a friend who's willing to wound, Scripture says, that's a wonderful thing. So if you can develop as a leader the ability to not in the moment, but with calmness, with with not accusations, but with questions, being candid and kind, you will distinguish yourself as a wonderful leader that will, will help develop people. I mean, we all have blind spots. Something was said to me yesterday. Um, about something that someone overheard me say. And you know what? I, they were right. Mm -hmm. And it was just very helpful. I will think about that. So I want to be coachable. I need to be coachable. And I just think that if we want to, you know, keep the peace, and that's all well intended, I'm sure. But that doesn't work. Over time, gossip is a cancer. So take the opportunity to talk to people, not about people. That would that would solve so many issues within churches, within ministries, within organizations. If people would kindly and carefully and not accusatorily talk with and to people, not about them, that would solve so many organizational issues and church issues. And, that, and the pastors ought to be the leaders in this. And the deacons and the elders ought to be leaders in this. And of course, we don't go confront everyone about everything. There are things that we need to let go. But if it's significant enough for you to talk to someone else about it, you should have started talking to that person about it. Yeah. And one final thing in this in this Sorry here, Eric, to, to go on, but this is so critical. Um, you know, I think we, we talk about, oh, I hate confrontation. I hate confrontation. And you know what? That, that's good. We should, we should live peaceably with all men, the New Testament says, as much as life. Within. Well, you know, if you like confrontation, frankly, there's something a little strange and off with you. 
But it's really not confrontation. It's about restoration. And the, the changing of that word from confirmation or confrontation to restoration is really helpful to just think, I'm not, I'm not here to make someone feel badly. I'm not here necessarily to rebuke someone. I'm here to restore someone to the right relationship with me or someone else. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, I'm glad you took the time to elaborate on that. I think even of that verse uh, in Proverbs, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend, uh, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. I mean, even, even those wounds from a friend um, are meant to be restorative. They're on the way somewhere. Um, they're not just punitive. It's not simply a confrontation to set something straight. And we all need people uh, in, in our lives that will speak the truth to us. Uh, that, that really is, uh, in the right way at the right time, the loving thing to do. Uh, I thought maybe we could uh, cover at least one more thing, uh, and that would be the issue of accountability. You mentioned as part of your approach to leadership um, that, that there's a, a third aspect that really has to do with this idea of inca- accountability. Um, you stress that we should embrace this. Uh, why, why is that? Well, you know, we're, we're all, I think Spurgeon said, you know, we're all really ready as Christians to, uh, to admit that we're sinners, as long as you keep it on the general level. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it gets specifics, we, we sort of run for cover. And, you know, men, especially men in ministry, men in leadership, again, we're supposed to be you know, this image, we're supposed to project something, and there's certainly something very appropriate about that. But men can be, uh, and all leaders, we, we, can, we can be very secretive, and secrets are dangerous. And so I think about accountability uh, in the spiritual life is, you know, it's very important. I mean, I have accountability uh, partners when it comes to the media that I watch. I mean, I literally have people that get a report every week about what I've seen on the web on all my devices. I, sh- I should embrace that. That's mm-hmm. not. That's not slavery. That's freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I get up uh, frequently and weigh myself every morning because you know I need to be reminded. Hey, you know what? Uh, I got to be careful with with what I eat, mm-hmm. and and if I'm am I exercising properly? So you think of a bathroom scale. That's 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 accountability. And when we think about um, Coaching, we, we're always talking about accountability with regard to are we actually progressing? And so I think things like having goals and budgets and 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 you know annual resolutions and um, goals for certain ministries within the church and reviewing those, for instance, every quarter. I think these things are wonderful because you know we want to have intentionality in our lives. Our lives are getting by very quickly. We want them to count. And so whether it becomes the matter of accountability with regard to our personal spiritual lives uh, and and having someone honestly being able to be accountable to, Mm -hmm. whether that be our own personal accountability to ourselves with regard to goals, or whether that be in our ministry or organization, I think accountability is something that that we ought to embrace because it's going to provide growth. It's going to provide protection in some cases. It's going to provide transparency and openness, all of which are part of being healthy as human beings. So yeah, accountability is a, is a thing that we typically run from and uh, we, we want to have uh, ambitions and we want to have uh, aspirations, but wow, when we get, we get held accountable and we have someone who, really reminds us and challenges us, uh, sometimes that's uncomfortable. But we don't want to have lives that just stay in a comfort zone. I want to be pushed. Um, you know, I I enjoy playing golf. Uh, I, I want to know, you know, that I'm getting better at golf. I've got a little app on my phone that keeps up with my scores. I do know what I weigh. Okay, I somebody's looking at my internet uh, every week. They've got a report. Are you spending a lot of time and you know in in an area that you shouldn't be? Or how much time are you spending on social media? Mm-hmm. I have goals for my Bible reading every day. I'm 
checking those off. That may feel restricted to some people, but that's what intentionality is all about. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've got a certain number of push-ups that I'm trying to do. So, you know, in all areas of life, you don't want to just kind of, you know, ramble through life. Um you know, are you praying about the number of people that you'd like to witness to this year, for example? Hmm. So they're just, you know, they're, I, I'm amazed at, at how people seem to go through life aimlessly. And I just don't see that in scripture. I see this, you know, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. That life is so precious uh, and and work while the, you know, while the, we still have the day, the night is coming when man is not going to work again or ever be able to again, the old song goes. So for all of these reasons, I think that, that I don't want to be someone that, that is held accountable, kicking and screaming. I want to embrace that. I want to run to that because that means that, that maybe that's going to help me be a little bit more productive in my life, a little bit more impactful in my life. And after all, isn't that what we're all about as Christians, making a difference for the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. That's good. I, I've thought many times over the past few years about um, the verse in Hebrews 3, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And it just really, a few years ago, hit me straight between the eyes that uh, any one of us as believers is not only um, a day away from being um, deceived, but we're actually um, just about a day away from being hardened in that deceitfulness. And mm-hmm. so God has actually put us in the body of Christ. He's raised up people around us, or if, if there aren't people around us, there need to be, um, to have this kind of ministry. This is what it means to walk together in love. And, uh, and we have to take some of that challenge, as you've been mentioning, upon ourselves, um, and, and also uh, exercise it in love toward those around us. Well, uh, Jim, thank you so much for your time. I uh, appreciate your uh, zeal for Christ's kingdom, appreciate your, uh, your friendship, and for helping us think uh, theologically about leadership. Uh, again, I've been talking with uh, Jim Wigginton, uh, and he is the president of Broad Insights, and we've been talking about how to improve our leadership uh, here in 2021. Thanks again, Jim. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Theologically Speaking. We trust that in the coming days, God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Life. That, that's mm-hmm. that idea of considering or, or examining. There's a relational basis. It's like, are you walking with God? Like something seems different. Mm-hmm. And then out of that, that that those relationships be about stimulating, mm, right. to provoke unto love, which in my in my mindset is right thinking and good works, right doing. Mm-hmm. That that us coming back together is that's what we desperately need. Not just that we all got back in the same place at the same time and we're doing our services again, but when God allows us to come back, this is how we're going to engage. We we miss these relationships, and these relationships as we come together have to be about the stimulating of one another to right thinking and right doing. So a return, yes, but maybe a return that that has a different emphasis yeah. in it than program. Yeah. A deeper connection with people. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I, and I see that. You know, there's these statistics that are starting to come out uh, about how many churches are closing, you know, in, in yeah. Canada and then the U.S. And, of course, the date stamp of this podcast, we don't really understand all that data yet, but we just you – know, we're starting to hear what's happening – and I think if I think the positive or the opportunity is there's going to be a clarity in the church hmm. um, for whatever reasons. And I'm not trying to say that those things are correlating to this, but but there is a clarity on who you know who who is who belongs to Christ, who is His church, hmm. and uh, who is looking to Him, and who who is part of that, and who is actually wanting to have life on life, and that vulnerability, and that accountability, and that just love 
that John talks about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's good. Um, in addition to your uh, pastoral experience and the interaction that you've had with uh, pastors over the last year or so, both of you um, have been appointed by the Lord to be in a position here at BJU uh, to influence young people and prepare them to be lifelong uh, participants in the local church, uh, both in uh, leadership uh, as well as in every member kind of ministry. So uh, final question for you. Um, how has the, the pandemic and, and all of uh, the political ripples of that that we have experienced this past year, how has it affected your outlook and contributed to uh, what you're doing and want to do here at BJU to train students for faithful local church ministry? Well, our, our students are being trained for 21st century ministry, and what I mean by that is we, we're we not building programs to try to fit students into boxes. We're really trying to to understand who our students are as they come in. And we're asking them questions like, you know, what are your spiritual gifts? How has God made you? What are you passionate about? Where, what home church have you come from? And, like, what is what is going on? What's that connection? And how can we help you go back to that home church and be actually even better more useful for the Lord because of your time being here and that we're investing in you and that we're stewarding together. And so we're we're really trying to design our programs around students so that they're not wasting time. They're not just taking this or that because they need to, but how can we take a program and actually say, this actually makes sense in you and these classes and the proportion that you're taking them actually makes sense for where you're going and where you where you envision the Lord would have you go. Yeah. I, tell us a little bit about the, the ministry and discipleship and some of the things you're doing, like with first-year ministerial students and that sort of thing. Yeah, so we have a we have a class called Introduction to Ministry and Leadership. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a new class that every person in the School of Religion, School of Ministry, takes. And this class has three, ma- three major modules. The first one is, what's your relationship with God and His Word? So we'll have entire lectures on, like, prayer. What does that look like? And, and have you ever thought about praying like this? And so we actually have Leighton Talbert, who's in our seminary, and I like to do this. I like to get some of my, the seminary guys come in and, and do to these freshmen, give give lectures on things that they're teaching at the MDiv or doctoral level even, and just make it really practical and say, okay, look, this is this is what prayer actually looks like. And so we have some real prayer warriors in the seminary that I think are great examples of that. So we have that, and then we have the second module is self-leadership. And basically this is how to lead yourself. Before, before you can lead anyone else, you have to know how to lead yourself. So we go through designing your own personal life mission statement, your vision statement, learning how to eliminate habits in your life that you don't want there, how to design, um, you know, understand your roles and your God-given roles and goals that are connected to that, and then really how to have good cycles of review, rest, and recreation, things that recreate you so that you don't burn out in ministry. And then the final module is um, basically getting outside your comfort zone. And we have a challenge. It's, this is not point-based. But we tell we asked students. We said, "Would you would you consider trying to find someone here on campus that's totally not like you, that's that's not like you in any way, and as much as possible, and try to become their friend genuinely and learn from them?" And you can write about it if you want to do that challenge. It's called the "Not Like You" challenge, and we've had many people take us up on it, and it's been a really really enjoyable thing to see. Yeah, that's really good. Ministering to those that really, probably because of this pandemic, are somehow going to be post-Gen Z students. Gen Z was very Mm -hmm. short-lived because of of the markers of of what marks a generation. And it's some kind of societal upheaval marked by then, uh, you know, a date span. And this this was traumatic enough that it's going to mark the changing of a generation. The question is, how are they changed? Mm -hmm. And when you take something like this pandemic that brings the level of societal controls that we as a Western civilization in particular just aren't used to, like, you can't tell me to stay home. How can you get so personal with me that you could tell me to put something on my face? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean I can't go eat at a restaurant? Uh, It's very unusual for us in, in our Western freedoms but there is that level of control, and, and as it is extended now to really, we're pushing a year, um, that, that there is I, a sense among young people that I don't want to rebel against that because I get it. We got to be safe. We got to be careful. But there's something in me that wants to lift the burden of control. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm looking for ways to find personal expression of something. Like there's, there's got to be something I can do that gives me that, that sense of, of an out. Mm-hmm. And and in sinful ways, there's manifestations of mm-hmm. that. We're seeing we're seeing more of the the 
the the spiritual psychological responses against controls that that we see when there's been abuse. Hmm. What, and, and I can't fix it. I can't deal with it. What do I do? There there are responses um, that that are choices that that look like taking an area of control that mm-hmm. I can deal with. We're seeing we're seeing some of that in thought patterns because there's this there's this something that controls me that I can't do anything about. Hmm. One of the remarkable opportunities that the gospel and gospel work gives us is actually to walk through the markers of who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. So identity, who am I in Christ? And identifying that is actually the core of dealing with with something that I can't control. Mm -hmm. And then out of that, then, then maturity. So if that's who I am, who should I be becoming? How should I be growing and changing? And that looks like identifying my gifts. And then in this generation uniquely, they're not just looking for something to do. There's a sense of community mm-hmm. that is a third factor. They're looking to do something together. And really what we are finding is if we can create ministry outlets, we are seeing a much greater response to those opportunities than we've seen in the past. Mm. And so, in a sense, creating opportunities that I feel a sense of control, what can I do? I can do good. Mm. Um, that that I, I, knowing who I am in Christ and growing in my gifts, I actually can further community. Like, I feel controlled, so what can I do? I can serve somebody else, or I can pull somebody into community. There's something we can do together. I think that is the vast opportunity for the church, particularly with young people moving forward is help them identify who they are in Christ, and that looks like identifying their gifts and find ways for them to serve and use those gifts. And it actually is the balm to the soul of feeling like, someone's telling me I can't. What can I do? I can actually serve God, and, and I can serve God through his church. And, and, and I think that's a massive opportunity for us, particularly with whatever this next generation is going to be labeled as. I would love to see them somehow labeled under terminology that is about world changers or, or, or investors in people or community builders because of a right response to this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully it will help us all focus um, on what really matters and getting back to the basics like you uh, mentioned there at the beginning, Alan. Well, thank you so much. You know, we have uh, listeners who, you know, they tune into this podcast because they care about the church and they they prayerfully want to contribute to what God is doing. And we praise the Lord for that. And and we hope this particular episode will encourage them uh, and maybe give them some scriptural food for thought. Uh, Alan and Kevin, thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you for having us. And appreciate your time today and what you're doing to serve the Lord and his church. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Theologically Speaking. We trust that in the coming days, God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ.